everybody. Um, I'm Mistress Ari from out here in Aitenveld. Thank you for joining our impromptu collegium. I am going to talk to you about how I do bone carving. There are a number of really excellent bone carvers uh, in the world, uh, both modern and in the SCA. Um, and everybody has their own technique. I find that Dremel's while fast, Fordham's while fast, and really great for getting some things. Um, I don't like the way the vibration and um, the friction cooks the bone in the natural material. I think it, it yellows it, and it also makes it brittle. Uh, the vibration isn't, isn't good for bone or antler. Uh, so I prefer to be a little bit more delicate. It takes me a lot longer to get where I'm going with the thing, but it is what it is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my workbench. There's actually another camera that we're going to focus on later when I actually get into carving. It's right here. And it's looking down at my workbench, but I'm going to talk to you all here for now because um, you're going to need to start with a toolkit. And the toolkit starts with a workbench. So you need a good sturdy wooden table. Now, I say sturdy. I got this one at Ikea. It's just one of their simple desks with this big open space. There is, within the set way back, because I need something to deaden uh, the blows that happen on this table. Uh, one of the things I added was a 50 pound free weight disc uh, that I picked up at Play and Played Against Sports and I shoved back in this, in this hole down here. And what that does is it helps uh, deaden vibrations. The other thing you're going to want to do is have a lot of clamps. I love my clamps, they keep things in place on top of uh, this bench, what I've done is I've added a simple uh, wooden cutting board. It's got a lip so it hooks on to the edge of the table, but this cutting board is going to keep you from damaging the actual work surface and give you a little bit more elevation. And I can move this cutting board around if I need to. I clamp things to my cutting board and to the desk. Everybody's going to have their workbench. Every jeweler has some form of jeweler's workbench and the cool thing about our workbenches is they evolve over time. You're going to figure out what you need as far as your workspace and what you need to hold your workspace in place and what it's going to take to keep all of your tools and everything you need right there at hand. Now, I'm looking at actually getting some cubbies and shelves to add to the top here so that I have everything a lot more in reach. Right now, all of my drawers are underneath, but I keep a lot of the big things in there. Um, Another thing you're gonna want is, especially if you're working with small things, you're gonna want a catch. So something that's going to catch all of the debris that's just gonna go across your lap. Uh, generally, I hang mine from the drawers. So I'll pull the drawers out and then have that catch there. And what this catch is gonna do is it's gonna catch all of the shavings, all of the little chips, everything that I kick out from my work with these tools because I'm going to make a lot of small debris and that debris is going to get on your floor, it's going to get in your clothes, it's going to get in everything. Um, one more reason why I find it's better to use hand tools over power tools is that when I'm using hand tools to carve with, I am not as concerned about bone dust. Bone dust and antler dust, something to consider when you're looking at carving bone or carving antler or anything that comes from another living creature, shell. Um, all of these things contain living matter or what used to be living matter. And as we all know, what's dead isn't fully dead. So by inhaling dust particles from that can be kicked off, from a Fordham or a Dremel or anything power tool that you use with these natural materials, you're going to want to cover your face with a really great mask if you're using a, a, a power tool at all. Hand tools are nice because the chips that are kicked off from a hand tool, be it carving or even minor sanding or minor filing, are gonna be small enough with simple fabric mask over your nose and mouth is going to be enough to prevent you from inhaling that particulate so you're not going to give yourself any funky diseases or lung issues um, or even stomach issues by inhaling particulate off of an animal that you don't know 
its upbringing or how it died or anything else that was involved in that animal. You can acquire bones either naturally. I, my preference is not to, um, simply because, you know, you can get bones from a butcher, but then you have to clean the bone. And I, having studied forensics and worked in a forensic lab in university, I find that bone cleaning is one of the tasks that I really, really hate. Because you've got to scrape it, you've got to dry it, you've got to boil it, you have to scrape it again, uh, and you have to sanitize it. And all of those things is a long, very drawn out process. It's good to know the process. But my preference is to go down to a PetSmart or a Petco and go to the dog chew toy section and buy pre-sanitized, empty, non-filled chunks of bone. These are cow femurs. They're inexpensive to buy for the length. Just paw through them until you find a cow femur that's got a, a nice depth. If you're looking to do a, a very highly uh, raised project with a lot of detail, you're going to want a thick piece of bone. You can find them really easy. Um, they usually come at about six to eight inches of length, and you can get various chunks of the bone. This one is interesting because it's got the end of the femur on it, so it looks kind of like a tooth. So I'm thinking I might be able to get a cool box out of this piece simply because of the shape. And again, the thickness is really good. And they come in plastic, so you can store them forever. And depending on what you're looking to do with the piece, um, there's lots of things you're going to have to be aware of when you're, when you're choosing them out. Number one, don't get the filled bones because then you're back to square one and having to clean it and sanitize it. Other things that you're going to want to consider is how much, how thin the piece is that you're looking at. Um, if you're doing something that's quite delicate, say a pen, and you don't want to do a lot of thinning work um, to carry that through to final completion, like this is a really long piece I was able to get a hold of. And you can, I've, I've actually cut a couple chunks out of it. So this ended up being a crossbar for a bone comb. Um, but these edges, you can see they can get very thin. This one is almost too thin. However, this section of it, um, what I'll do is I'll cut lengths from it to about here. And I can get null bending needles and sewing needles out of this end. So, and if you're cutting comb teeth and for whatever reason the plate fails and the teeth and a tooth breaks out, um, sharpen that thing up, drill a hole in one end, and you've got a sewing needle. And bone sewing needles are some of the best sewing needles you can use for um, wools and linens, especially ones that aren't too closely woven and any of your period fabrics, um, simply because they're not going to tear the fabric at all. And they actually get more smooth as you go. So as they age and the more use you put to them, the smoother and finer the needle gets. So. Um, I have some that are terrifyingly sharp. They're sharper than any metal needle I've ever owned in my life. So needles, you can get needles, you can get all kinds of things out of these. But again, get it, go ahead and invest in just going down to your, to your pet store, especially if you're just learning, because um, you're gonna save yourself a lot of heartache. And these, this stuff is, they're, they're easy to get, they're pre-cleaned, takes a lot of the effort off of your shoulders. Um, other materials, that are used, um, especially in uh, period crafts, if you're looking back, ivory, of course. I don't prefer to use ivory at all um, because I would rather the ivory stay on the animal. Uh, if it's naturally shed, uh, say a tusk from a walrus or another animal that naturally sheds them, that are then collected by native peoples that are selling through approved channels that you can then acquire through an approved channel from a licensed vendor, if that is your choice, more power to you. Go, go ahead. Um, keep all your paperwork. <laughs> um, also, reclaim scrimshaw. So if it's something that's been sold as scrimshaw that you have the paperwork for, that you are then able to um, remove the scrimshaw and use the piece, if that is your choice, you can do that. Uh, antique pool balls, pool balls um, for pool tables. Um, those are actually originally made of ivory. So uh, piano keys. I don't recommend or condone tearing up antiques to get to these things, but if you find them for whatever reason and you're able to acquire them, that's one thing to do. Um, fake ivories, faux ivories uh, that I've seen is essentially plastic. You're carving plastic. It carves like plastic. It works like plastic. It even smells like plastic when you're sawing it or filing it. I am not a fan of the fake 
fake ivories, faux ivories. I would rather just work in bone. And that's one of the other materials that you can work in. And there are a number of different antlers that, and antler is a shed thing. And it's perfectly acceptable to get, just be sure of what kind of antler you're getting. Uh, deer, most all deers um, uh, have really good, it, so long as they shed their antlers, they're great. Uh, Tagonut, you can use tagonut um, for a replacement ivory. It is, however, a nut. It's still a natural material, and you can do small things with it. If you're trying to do large boxes, tagonut doesn't work so well. Um, so I would substitute bone in those cases. Um, when you're talking about an antler, so this is a moose palm. So it's the part that branches out to make the fan. Um, so they can get quite large. This is actually from a very small piece of a moose palm. And you have a lead edge, you have an obverse, and then you have the face side. And I've smoothed this one off, and you can see how absolutely smooth and relatively flat you can get these pieces. But you also have to be aware that antler has a pith. So this piece here is going to be more spongy than the enamel around the outside. So when you're working with antler, the choice pieces are always going to be that enamel that you see on the outside of it because antler has blood flow and therefore antler is spongy in the middle. You can also see that in this piece. So you can see that it's got three layers. And you can also get antler pieces at um, the pet stores for two toys as well for dogs. It's good for their teeth. We do. Uh, so you have your enamel on the outside, and then you have the central ring. So this is where the majority of the blood flow is going to be, is in this darker area. And then you have the skeleton of the antler. So think of them like teeth or anything. This is a large structure that is coming from the head of the animal off the skull. And so this piece is more solid than this dark piece. And then the enamel is the most solid and actually the, the most fun, in my opinion, to carve on. Um, it is harder to work than bone. Yes? I have a question. Oh, sorry. Um, can you remove the pith of the antler and just have the enamel? Yes, you can. Um, this one's very spongy. Uh, so this pith, uh, this piece of the antler is from a sandbar stag, which is native to India. And you can see how big around this is. I'm actually uh, going to be turning this into a cup. I'm making uh, a unicorn, period unicorn exhibit. So one of the things is a purifying cup. So this is going to be cleaned. The outside is going to be removed. So all of this roughness is going to be removed down to the enamel and then carved. But I have to finish clearing, coring this pit. How do so you, you remove the outside? It's quite spongy. Ooh, how do you remove the outside that Files. isn't the enamel? Files and chisels. Um, I can show you a clean piece. So this is one of the tines off of a sandbar stack. Uh, they, the whole half rack um, for this, I was able to order online. Uh, a half rack cost me about $150. This is one of the tines. That's massive. <laughs> Yeah, they're massive. These animals, uh, you're looking at easily a six to eight foot spread on the tines, uh, on the rack. So very big animals. And so this, as you can imagine, is going to be a quite an impressive unicorn horn. Uh, however, you can see it takes a little bit to file off and get down to the enamel. And I may just keep these and work them into the carving. But again, it's got a very spongy pit. So, but these are native to um, Central Asia and uh, India. So the kind of jobs that you're gonna get from antlers like this are different from what you're going to get from European deer, which are more solid like this. So, but this spongy core is absolutely useless for carving. It, it, it won't hold an image better just clay or cast. 
what's your suggested tooling for for doing the coring? Um, I usually get in with a drill, and so I'll clamp it to a table, and I'll get in with um, an egg beater drill, and start, and then just once I've got a hole started, I can get in with gouges and gouge. And would that be woodworking gouges, or is there a specific bone gouge? Actually, um, ironically enough, uh, hardwood gouges and uh, uh, are perfectly good for using on bone. Um, the tools I use for carving, for the most part, are going to be these. Um, these are uh, Mueller, Mueller uh, high-speed gravers. So they're actually palm gouges. Uh, metal engravers use these tools as well for okay, doing. So it, is it more for metalworking? It's because you're you're trying to balance the the thick the stiffness of the material with the cutting edge, right? Yeah. Uh, bone is going to wear out your edges a lot. Bone and antler, especially, the hardness of the material is going to wear out your edges far quicker. Um, but if you're just simply coring out uh, pit, uh, it's perfectly acceptable to use touches to do so. And drill, drill a drill is your friend. Um, another thing that you're going to develop is a love for various types of hack saws and coping saws, because that's how you're gonna cut your pieces free. Um, I, uh, one of my funniest trips to the hardware store, I had, Three pieces of a bone, a chunk of antler because I was trying to figure out the right saw, a uh, saw blades, a couple of drills, and a tarp, and a mask. And they looked at me like they were contemplating whether or not they needed to report me to the police. You're going to get to people looking at you funny depending on when you do your shopping. Uh, another source of honesty that is actually really acceptable um, so long as it's come from a reputable vendor, we here in Tucson are quite fortunate that we have the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show that comes through, and we have vendors that sell mammoth ivory. So uh, this is from a reputable vendor at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. Uh, this is a chunk of mammoth ivory. It's, you know, it, this is just the outside of the tooth. So uh, this is just going to be the enamel, but you can see, it has a grain. So these limbs, especially ivory or anything like bone, all of them, I'm showing you this one because it's really pronounced, uh, have flake layers because our teeth and neck thing grow in layers and they also have a grain. Uh, ivory is really, really nice because the grain is not as pronounced um, in uh, a more recently a live animal, whereas in a long dead animal, such as a mammoth, uh, and you can see that it's got a station to it and you can really see the grain. Um, that's because it is dried to the full extent that it can dry out and it's taking on some amount of fertilization. So if you choose to work with mammoth ivory, you're also going to run into, there's minerals in here, it's now trying to become stone instead of strictly a, a natural thing that is a living matter item. So uh, you're going to dull your tools a lot faster carving uh, mammoth ivories. Um, but if you can get them from a reputable source, it is worth getting them and playing with them. Um, this one will probably turn into um, either a small grooming comb or uh, a couple of pendants of some form. It depends on how forgiving uh, this grain is going to be while I'm working it. But another reason to work with only hand tools is it's easier to limit the amount of stress you're putting on the material uh, with a hand tool than it is with a power tool. Uh, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm a huge fan of hand tools. Um, so when I'm talking about rack antlers and a half rack and a full rack, I'm going to break out something here. So everything lives under my workbench. So this is fallow deer. And so if you're work looking at doing European um, pieces or um, Viking age, any of the, uh, the Nordic countries and the European countries, especially anything from the Nordic countries and European, Central Northern European, 
fallow deer. Um, it's a beautiful animal, uh, but you can see it's got quite the curve here. This can be used for a number of items, uh, knife handles, um, needle cases. More importantly, I got this because of this big flat area here on both sides. Now, knowing that this is going to have a pith and going to be hollow, I can use various sections of this for making um, combs and or making cards for tablet weaving or any of a number of other tools that may need to be big and flat. And they come in various shapes and sizes, uh, depending. I got these from a vendor at Penzik and dropped them home in my luggage. And I'm sure the TSA was very upset with me. Um, so this is another chunk of that sandbar bag that I was talking about. And so you can see that pit is very pronounced. Not a lot of an animal here. This is a hot weather animal versus a cold weather animal. Okay. So cold weather animals have more enamel? Uh, cold weather animals have denser antlers. A hot weather animal has uh, more, they're just not as dense. So, I mean, even this is the base of an antler and you can see that it's still very, very spongy. The pith is not as, I mean, the enamel is not as thick. And this is simply because it's a hot weather animal. Okay, whereas this is a moose. <laughs> this is a cold weather animal. That pith is really dense. I could actually carve it and probably get away with it. So side by side, cold weather, hot weather. and hang on to your scraps, scraps are useful. So this one is a failed um, crossbar for a comb, but I can use it for making a smaller piece. I would just you know, cut off this end and do a three hole one and then cut another piece that matched or could work with this and have a crossbar for a comb. Um, it failed out on me, I was sad, I went and cut a new one. Um, these are good pieces for getting needles out of. So just think about your scraps and what you're doing. Uh, this one's actually on the way to becoming a needle. So if your scrap, if you think it's big enough, go ahead and save it to work on it. Um, let's talk about carving tools. Um, first thing, bench pen. This is bench pen. It's really cheap, easy to make, just a length of, uh, I guess it's a one by three, one by four. Anyway, you get this, your Lowe's, your Home Depot's, your, your lumber yards, just by a length of soft pine, you are going to abuse the shit out of it. Do not invest in hardwood, you don't need to. Bench pens are meant to be abused and used up and tossed and you make a new one. Um, so all I did, cut the length I need, cut a notch in it. The reason for the notch is because I use this for or cutting comb teeth or doing anything where I need the piece supported on either side while I'm working on something in the middle that's going to cause a lot of vibration and back uh, forking of the piece. And so a bench pen is really useful when you're cutting comb teeth. Um, bone combs are a really incredibly nice thing to have when you can get them. Um, I also use it for filing. So if I have a piece like this, you can set it up across the tool here, clamp it in place and drill that hole. But this is going to be supported on either, so I'm not breaking the piece I'm working on while I'm working with it. So bone is brittle in cases and very strong in others. So um, when you're working with it, it's always good to just keep it supported while you're working. Um, another thing you're gonna wanna make is, um, or have on hand, they're really easy to make. So I just make mine, clamp, get the clamp out of the way, you can't make your clamps. But um, this is another one of my bench pens. And this one I actually take with me when I'm traveling to events. And the chunk of two by four, this side you can see, it gets a lot of hammer strikes, it gets a lot of drill holes, it gets a lot of all holes, it has cutting marks, filing marks, um, because what I do with this, I clamp it down to the surface, 
and then I do all my drilling and then I'll flip it over and I've stapled down just a, a piece of shoe leather. The staple gun it to it, you can nail it to it if you don't have a staple gun. And this is my work surface. So it's a lot softer. So while I'm carving, my piece is supported, but it's not getting marred by the wood underneath. And then I've nailed a little nail in there. And so that nail, when I'm working with a piece, I can take that hole, place it over the nail. And so what it's doing is it's giving me a thing that is actually resisting any direction so that when I'm carving, I can actually free rotate this piece on the bench pen and have it resist my carving against it. But I can change my direction far more easy. So this works um, like a ball. Um, like a ball vice, but uh, a much more simplified, less expensive way to get to something that's gonna give me the ability to tease and still work with it and support it at the same time. The final piece, and this one is just, it's not a requirement, but I like having it. It's just a big flat one that I can also work on if I just need a big flat surface. Um, so this is just a piece of plywood that again, I stapled shoe leather down to and I love this thing. It it just I like working on it. I like how soft but supportive it makes the the work surface. So this it's usually the first one I clamp down to the work surface, and then I will uh, clamp other things on top of it. Oh, um, sanding meetings, things to sand with. You are going to spend a lot of time with your bone and sanding your bone after you're done with it. It's just pre-cut fine grain sand. Um, I also use these sanding, um, they're used for, for finishing, for finishing furniture. But I like this because I can hold it and conform it to the shape of the thing I'm working with because a lot of what I'm working with is small and three-dimensional. Um, so basic rough sanding you're gonna do with these. Um, you're also gonna want a set of needle files. So, So all different shape sizes of needle files, because sometimes it's easier just to file bone or antler rather than carve it to get to the shape you need. Um, you can cut it out as close as you feel you're comfortable cutting it out and then go to town with the files and the gouges. Um, other tools for really close work, um, this clamp, you can get them from Rio Grande, but this wedge is what helps hold the tension. So if I'm actually wanting to work with a thing in my hand, I can take the piece, clamp it down into it, tap that in place, and this is going to be held firmly so that I can then work with it. So if I need to do like some fine filing on a piece, uh, this is going to allow me to hold on to it to keep my hands away from the piece and have a, a better grip when I'm working with it. This is fatiguing, so your hands are going to get tired and wear out. And it's not as firm a grip as just a straight clamp. So let's talk about some tools. Uh, as if you would do Master Ivan's woodworking, he had a really great straw that was um, for a uh, fixing the edges on his uh, gouges. Uh, they have similar things for the tools that I use, except they're about this big. And it has a pointed edge for getting into your V-shaped gouges, and it has a rounded edge for your curved gouges, and it has a flat edge for fixing the outside. It's just small. Um, also, I love this thing. This is a very fine whetstone. Um, it's the material is called aluminol, uh, but it is uh, fine enough that I wanted to tape it down to a piece of cardboard so that I wouldn't lose it and I could always keep it in my kit. But you just drop a piece of some water or some honing oil, or if you're out in the wild and you don't have either of those, your saliva will work just fine. You just need a bit of a lubricant on the surface and this will help bring um, your edges back to true. So there are uh, circle and dot designs in um, a lot of ornamentation on bone. So what I did is I went to, when I was going through the hardware store, 
and I picked up a cheap set of screwdrivers. You can see they're wickedly cheap. I think I spent $5 on this. The next thing I was going to do was to come in with a file and absolutely abuse the edges of these screwdrivers because what I was making were circle and dot tools. You can see that there's now a V-shape. And so when I'm doing circle and dot, I'm going to make sure that one corner of this is down in the work surface that I'm working with. And then I can turn it. I will turn the screwdriver. And what that does is when it's anchored in place, it'll give me a circle just by doing this. So it's kind of like a drill, but what it's doing is it's cutting, gouging very gradually. Don't try and do everything all at once, but it's gonna gouge a circle while leaving a dot. So if you've ever taken a compass to a piece of paper and drawn a circle, this is effectively what you're using to do that, but in bone. And because they're uh, the eyeglass ones, I like them. People have, other people have uh, done the same thing with normal screwdrivers or even, um, a modified roofing nail, but I like these because they have this little piece on the end that lets me place my, my hand while I'm working with it and turning it. So this one is a very, very tiny one with the same idea. So if I want little, little tiny ones because I'm working with a little tiny um, piece, then I have a smaller size. And you can make them out of larger size, but basically you're just gonna start with a screwdriver, looks a lot like this one, and then you're just gonna notch a V in the end. And if you have a particularly wide one of these, you can actually do two notches and get a double ring effect. Is, is it more common to see V-shaped circle and dot tools rather than more W-shaped ones where there's like a central point with two shallower points on the outside edge? If you have a double pointed one, you're doing two circles around a single dot. Oh no, this is a, a three-pointed one where there's a, a single central point and then two smaller points. I, again, I, this is just things I've seen. They may not be real or correct. It's the preference of the maker. So one of the tenants I, I, I work by and live by is the fact that there are as many ways to do a thing as there are people making them. This holds true throughout time because even in the Middle Ages or earlier in the Bronze Age, the Dark Age, there wasn't a lot of cross um, talk as far as makers go. It was, I'm sending my boy off you, or if you're even earlier, I'm in my tribe, you're in your tribe, never our tribe shall meet except on special trade days, and great uncle Kevin or aunt Susan, who's over in the corner making something for the tribe, is going to make it in her own method. It may look the same as everybody else's to a point, but her way or his way of doing that thing is exclusive to them. And it's gonna be different from the guy 10 miles, 20 miles away, who's also making the same thing for the use of their truck. So their okay. tools are gonna to be custom to what they do. All right, Thank what you. are you using to make the V shape? What, are you using a file or? Can you repeat that? Are you, what are you using to make that V shape? A file or uh -huh. some kind of treble? No, I'm actually using a file, and so let me adjust my view a bit. So we're going to look down on this, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by clamping my bench pen out of the way. I'm just going to move it out of the way. So if I were to want to make one of these, I would take my screwdriver, and I would figure out where I wanted that piece to be, that, that mark to be. I'm gonna put on my magnifying glasses because I'm horribly blind. So you can see where that is, that edge. So I'm gonna go and grab my needle file. I know this isn't bone carving, but it's prepping to bone carving, so it's kind of the same thing, right? So I'm gonna get my needle file. I'm gonna, and this one here is triangular. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mark where on the edge I want that to be, and then I'm just gonna run it down the file, and gradually it's going to shape the piece so that I end up with a notch. And once I get that notch, then I can you know, clamp it down and go to town as far as my filing goes. But my whole goal is to put a notch in that that's then gonna turn into a V shape. And I'm not gonna do the whole thing here because basically I'm trying to file tool steel and that sucks. 
So I really want it to be clamped down. But the whole point is to take this triangular shape, get it, it roughly in the center of your uh, flat edge, and then just file it until you get that V shape. And make sure one point, one edge, is going to be longer than the other because you want that longer point to be the one in the center of your of your dot that's your dot and yes it's going to cut a dot because it's still going to have that rough sharp edge and then your other point which is going to be slightly shorter is what's going to cut the circle into the surface of the bone or the antler that you're working with so let's talk a little bit about our graver tools since we've talked about a bunch of other things I'm going to go ahead and clamp this down to the table and then I will adjust it so that you can all see what's going on. And don't be afraid to have these bench pens far out. The nice thing, the whole point of the bench pen is to get the work surface. So the point of the bench pen is to take your work surface away from uh, the, the table and over so it's more suspended. Um, and it's also higher. This has given me like an extra eventual four inches in height to my work surface so that I'm going to be able to work on things with things and not feel confined by my table. The piece that I've been making is a cloak pen and it has a raven that I've been carving into the surface but the pen itself this is a kite headed cloak pen and what this would do is it would especially on a loose woven fabric, like a, 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 hand, a hand woven wool that was specifically uh, thick and made for cloaks, this would poke between, so the shape here pushes between the fibers of the piece, and it's not terribly thick, but it does have a nice point. I could actually hurt myself or somebody else with this point if I wasn't careful. Bone can get quite, quite, quite sharp. But the edge is not meant to be sharp. This is not a knife. It's still rounded off on the edges. And then it comes to a narrow piece here. So it's more like a leaf headed shape. And what that's gonna do is offer a little resistance to the piece pulling out. And then this is a decorative. So it's a decorative design. And eventually I will have another design on the other side. So depending on my mood, I could have my raven or I could have whatever I choose to place on this side. I, have, I spent a lot of time pre-shaping this and shaving it down. Um, to be the right shape and size and just working the does become kind of neat. And then I drilled the hole because as I showed you, I like to put it down on the surface with it and that it's going to resist movement but still allow me to carve uh, freely. But hole also serves another purpose so that once I'm done with this pen, I'm going to make a lanyard for it uh, with a toggle on the end and the toggle will stop at the hole the lanyard goes through the hole so that when i push this through fabric i'm just tying this around the points of it and it will stay in place my, it's not going to off my body and i have this beautiful piece of jewelry that i get to wear that's also utilitarian so that's the piece that we're working on and we're going to talk a bit about the tools so i'm going to show you my basic set of tools I use all the time for doing these. And we're gonna start with, uh, these are all um, Mueller high-speed gravers. You can get them at Woodcraft, you can get them online. Um, you can order them from Rio Grande, you can order them from uh, Costenti. I find from Costenti online. Um, they're a really great uh, purveyor of engraving tools and gouges and other tools for uh, craftspeople. So you give them for it. So you're gonna buy the handle. I like mushroom shaped handles simply because they fit in my palm really nicely. I have I have sense, but the whole idea of this handle is that it's gonna sit right here so that your pressure is actually coming not from moving your whole arm or from moving your fingers. Your finger is just there to stabilize the tool. The pressure, the 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 cutting movement comes from moving your hand like this. So the pressure is going to be on this tool so that when you move it, it's actually pushing very, it's pushing this tool and you can control it like you're drawing with a pencil. So you would control the tool like this. But movement is coming just from moving your hand by pushing down on your palm. Back. 
So that's the movement you're doing with a palm graver. But you see some of this, it's the millimeter square. But the square is cut at an angle so that you have a point that you're working with. So I have a square, I have a point, and it's a really wicked point that I'm working with. The last thing you want to do is drive it into your hand because it hurts like dickens. But you can see that point there. And that's the point I'm working with. Uh, another tool that I'm very, very fond of is this is uh, Mueller High Speed again. So anything, it's going to say Mueller, and then it's going to have an HS on it, which means high speed, which means it's uh, hardened tool steel that is um, uh, meant for fast cutting, high speed. Uh, this is a number 53, and it's uh, a round. So the tip on this, if you can see, is actually rounded. They look a lot like knives, but this tool, the great thing is, so you can see the, the cross section of this tool is it's flat on this edge, it's rounded on this point, and then it's got sharp, well, not sharp, but very square sides, kind of like a knife. This edge is round. So you're not going to hurt yourself holding this edge, and you're going to be putting pressure on this top flat piece here. And again, you hold it like this, just like it's holding the sides of the blade like this. So when you're cutting, again, the pressure is coming from the movement of my hand this way to do using this rounded edge to, to actually remove material with. I can also use these side edges for removing material, but then I would be holding the tool like this and doing really fine shaving work with it, which is why it's important that these edges are tool steel and that you can actually keep kind of, a, of an edge on them. It's not a sharp edge, but it's still a bit of an edge. Uh, the next one I use, which is actually one I use almost all the time, it's my favorite, is a number one onglet. Again, it's Muller tool steel, so an onglet, the cross section looks like this, so it's kind of rounded, but it has a very sharp point here, just like that square. The blade itself, though, has a rounded profile, kind of a leaf shape, like this. It's actually shaped just like this, the onglet cross section. But the bottom of this can also carry a bit of a resistive edge. And the reason I like this is that I can actually use this to take off a bit like a draw knife. If I don't have a draw knife, I can use this for removing, and you can see it's removing material. Um, so it's shaving just a little bit of that material away. And that's just because I was not pressing terribly hard because it makes a lovely squeaking noise. Um, but you can use this to take things down to flat, uh, to true up a surface, and to remove like a miscut if you're not, if you're just starting out, you can use those draw knives. So one of the things that a draw knife is useful for, and I recommend getting one, I just don't have mine handy, it's off in another section of the storage area, is um, when you're making combs or when you're making plates. So say if I was making um, uh, cards or card weaving, out of antler or I was making a, uh, a comb, I need to shave down those plates and part of shaving down those plates after you cut them from the, the surface um, is you would take a draw knife and you would shave them down so that they're all the same thickness and they're all relatively square. So that's what you would use a draw knife to do. So, any questions about those? What was the size on that square? You you glipped a little. It's a. I'm sorry. the The square is a number three. So it's a three millimeter square. That's a three millimeter square. This one is a number fifty three round. And this is a number one onglet. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Uh, you can acquire other gouges. I don't find them to be terribly useful unless I'm working on a big piece. So this one again is a molar. 
and it is a proper gouge, but it's a very shallow gouge. So you can see, hopefully, that the section there rounded off a bit. And it's a different sort of mushroom handle. Uh, this one, I believe, is an eight. Um, so I recommend getting onto Cosenti or or another site, or even going down to Woodcraft and checking out the gouges and the tools there and figuring out what fits best in your hand. And I would not buy too many of these rounded ones until you figured out what you were doing. Because when you're working with bone, the only part of the surface that's actually going to meet the bone is quite minimal um, because of the rounded shape. So I'm, I'm using it, but I'm using it in a more vertical manner to actually kind of get in and clear out a ground and to be fair as you can see this one's far too big for that um, i would use a much smaller tool for getting in there and getting that ground cleared out something to consider when you're when you're working with these various tools um, i i picked up a bunch because i thought they would be useful and then i figured out they were not uh, this one i have gotten a bit of use out of this one is a four millimeter gouge so this one is actually a little bit more useful at the scale that i work in uh, for getting in and clearing out things. Now, the larger gouges you can use for digging out, uh, coring out antler. If you want to uh, make a hollow tube, you can absolutely use those larger gouges once you drill the drill down so you can get the gouge in there and then just get that gouge in there and, and clear them out and core them out. Um, but these smaller gouges, this one, and you want something that's relatively flat. You don't want a lot of uh, deep V's or deep circles because the surface that you're working with, it's not going to encounter the surface very well. This one's a much better slide though for what I'm doing. And I'm going to come at it fairly vertically and then move my hand down. And it's only going to take away a little bit of material, but that little bit of material is enough to help flatten out this surface. So this surface is kind of rough. You can see kind of from the contrast here um, how it's all scratched and what I'm doing is I'm getting in there and I'm just going to clear out try and smooth some of that out from the pre-work so I use my other gouges to kind of come in and clear it out so what I'm doing now is trying to get in there and clear out that material and you can see that once I get the right angle but the whole point is to actually come in and you're pushing down with with your hand then you're not actually pressing with your arms so much as down with your hand and that's actually going to get in there and clear out that material and you're going to want to try and avoid chipping your piece um, once you cut it away you can glue it back in but it'll never be the same and it will yellow at a different rate and because we don't color bone all that often it's kind of a futile effort. I've thrown away more bone pieces than I care to imagine, or I have gone in and completely reconsidered my design because I accidentally cut away too much. That foot doesn't need to be that big. I'll make a smaller foot. Um, oops, part of its beak is gone. Well, how do I change that? And so these are the considerations that you're going to go through uh, while you're working with these pieces. And so you can see the debris that comes from it is not that large, so I'm not really worried too much about inhaling um, that material. So what we've got here is the start of a raven, kind of a Pictish style raven going on. Um, but he's got his head tucked back. And the idea here when you're starting with relief in any of these is that this is a subtractive art. So I can't put material back when I am doing carving. I can only take material away. So I have to think about where I'm going almost constantly. So when I'm starting with this, I am going to rough out the outside of that shape. So I want to see my design. I want to get in there and I want to say, okay, I know that my raven isn't going to extend past here. So I've come in and I've said, this is my outer edge of where I'm working. This is my rough shape. And how I did that is I came in with a liner and I outlined where it was I was going to be cutting. And I can always go back and repeat this process, but I outlined where I was working, where I was cutting. And you can, I can so now you can kind of see 
the benefit of having that nail there is that the nail gives me the ability to not worry so much about holding it this way, but it gives me a pivot that I can use so that when I'm coming in and working around one of these circles, I can keep it on my surface and turn it with a little bit more freedom and a little bit more control than if I was attempting to do this without it. So you can then kind of come in and sweep that away and get, a, get an idea of what you're doing. So again, you're going to start with just kind of coming around your design and working that tool. And I'm starting with my square simply because the square is your liner. This is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm just kind of chunking out where I want things to be. And don't feel like you're limited to only the point. Uh, yes, you can end up with a lot of stabbed fingers. You learn to avoid stabbing your fingers, uh, which is why you don't want to press with your whole arm. You just want to press with your hand because if you're only pressing with your hand, you're not going to skip as much. And your fingers should be, and your hand should be far enough away over here that you're not going to skip into it because the most I can get distance wise is that, which is still plenty far away from my poor hand. So, where were we? So, we're looking at this, and we've basically lined out what we want. We've kind of chunked it out, and we've said, okay, I've got feet here. I've got a leg here. Um, is this leg in front of or behind this one? I want this leg to be the one on top. Yes, I drew the design first on pencil. So we can start with back here. We're going to look at the back. So if I was to um, look at this space, I would want to think about um, what sort of design I want, if I want a border on it or not, if it's going to fit um, my space. So. I can say, well, the other side had a border. So I can kind of pencil one in. And Bone is really quite forgiving with pencil because pencil doesn't actually gouge the bone at all, especially a nice soft number two. Um, we all had them in school, know them, love them, use them all the time. So we can just mark out that, okay, I may want to put a thing inside this frame. And then I would need to figure out what kind of thing I wanted in this frame. Well, since I'm this is the top. This is always going to be the top. This is the bottom because this is the piece that points down to the ground when I'm wearing my cloak. So either I want the design to be oriented this way, such as a serpent, or I want it oriented this way. Um, so you can't really see that. There you go. Or I want it oriented this way. So if I was to orient it this way, I can think about, okay, what kind of creature, what do I want in here? Do I want simple knot work? Do I want something else going on in this space? Um, geometry is a thing. Geometry was used all the time. Uh, I think that since the front side, the animal was looking down, uh, this side, the animal is going to be looking up. So I'm just going to start with a head. And then let's make this a serpent. So we're going to bring him around. I'm going to say, OK, so his body's doing this. And we'll just start with a simple knot, right? So figure eight's the thing. If we bring it back, we have now created for ourselves the basic, a basic urn style knot work animal, just like that. Now, of course, generally they're chewing on their tails or some other nonsense because, you know, dragons. So we're just gonna have his mouth a little bit fierce. And I may go back and refine his shape later. The eyeballs are generally teardrop shaped. His head's probably his head is too big. The bone is forgiving. So we're just gonna come in. I like him better like that. Just more narrow than his eyeball. To be a little Bob Ross here. Happy little dragons. And then you just follow your knot around. Since his head's pretty big, I want him to go under. So I'm going to go ahead and draw this over. So it's going to go under this one. So we already know that it's just going to do this. So 
So this one went over, so this is going to come over here. And it needs to get more narrow because we're obviously working down to his tail. Because this one went over, it's going to come over under here. It's going to come over here. And I have more to play with there, so I have a lot more space I can play with with this guy. So we can do other things with him. And because he's a beast, he's a fell beast. Let's go ahead and give him a leg. So we're going to start with a spiral here. We're just going to come out. And since he's coming under here, he needs to go over, his head needs to come over something. So his head's going to go over this. We're going to take that leg down. And we could even interlace that leg through um, this knot if we wanted to expand it out um, to be far more. I mean, it would be elegant for it to do so, but then if we went over this, we'd go under this, we'd go over his head again. So we have to think about how we're doing these things. So it's just a matter of kind of drawing them out and you can cheat a bit. They certainly did. They did not strictly adhere to the rules. So even in urns, you can look at a lot of these not work animals. And if it didn't make them happy artistically, they just didn't do the, the interlace properly or geometrically as we would like to be. I think modern humans have, they suffer from an overabundance of perfection syndrome. Everything has to be perfect. And honestly, everything does not have to be perfect. Um, it's the imperfections that make things interesting. So we're just gonna go ahead and kind of give him a dragony foot. So he's kind of gone over and he's chomping on his own foot because why not? And so if we were to then, now that we have this basic creature shape in, he's kind of fun. We can, we should probably give him another leg somewhere or he'll look silly. So we'll give him another leg here. And it doesn't need to be near so long as the other one. Beautiful thing about urns creatures is they actually dragged out the shape if they needed it longer and made it more narrow if they needed it narrow. Their beasts are funny shaped and I like them a lot. So, and we can just coil his tail there. It's gonna be a really fine piece if we do, but there we go. So now that you have this design drawn in and you have an idea of what you're doing, you can get your, your square here, which is your liner. And we're gonna make sure it's sharp. Mine isn't quite as sharp as I would like. So I'm just gonna go ahead and break out my honing stone. And so when you're honing a piece, you want to make sure that when you're holding it, you're flat. So that that piece there is flat on the surface. As flat as you can get it. And you just want to drag it forward and backward just a little bit. And all that's going to do is make sure that your point, your point is good and sharp. Because all we're doing is we're re-honing that point. If you're uncomfortable drawing directly on the bone, can you start on paper and transfer later? Yes, absolutely. Um, I've done it before. What I'll do is I'll, uh, dra I'll draw the shape of the piece that I'm going to be uh, working the design on. And then I'll, I'll do it on um, like vellum, like a, the tracing paper vellum, and draw out that design that I really like, make sure it fits the shape, make sure everything's perfect. Um, and then you have two choices at that point. If you've done it in soft pencil, uh, you can flip it over so you'll get the uh, mirror image of whatever it was that you drew and then just rub really hard on the bone surface and that'll transfer it. Uh, do not lacquer bone. Um, so you can then um, uh, rub it down and that'll transfer the design and then you can pencil it in again. Or you can ink over your drawn design on your vellum and then pencil over the back and rub it down and that'll transfer that design right on. So it's kind of like doing carbon paper. Um, bone, the only thing, you should not lacquer bone. I do not lacquer bone. Um, when I am done carving this piece here, um, I will, it's already quite shiny. The most bone ever needs to preserve it. Lacquer will actually cause it to yellow and crack over time and destroy the bone. Whereas for bone, if I'm using it as a tool, what I'll do is I will take um, diatomaceous earth. <laughs> is used most frequently. So this stuff, this lovely white powder, this is my final polishing medium. 
Um, most of the time it's used for keeping bugs out of houses and gardens because it's highly, highly, highly powdered silicate, uh, a glass-like uh, substance. So do not breathe this. It's not a poison, but it'll hurt you. Um, and wear gloves. And what I do is you take it and then I will embed it in a piece of wool like this. And then I will rub the surface to get that final polish up. And then you take a chunk of beeswax. And this is the only thing you need with foam. It ages beautifully. I take beeswax, natural beeswax, and I rub the piece with the beeswax. And then I take my wool again, a new piece of wool, and I rub it, polish it down in there, polish it really good because the warmth of your hand and the polishing friction is going to warm up the beeswax enough to melt it down into the bone. And that's all it ever needs. It will self polish and color as it ages. And it's that beautiful coloring, that beautiful um, polishing and aging that you want. Uh, lacquer is destructive. Uh, most, most all lacquers are just destructive and they're not reversible. Um, so uh, I would absolutely do not, I don't ever lacquer my bone pieces. Um, so that's, that's a personal preference, but I find lacquers to be uh, quite destructive. Oh, and something I didn't really cover is when you first start with like one of these pins, the shape of your piece is going to look a lot like this. So your chunk of bone is going to look pretty gnarly. Um, and it's a lot of work to get it down into shape. So um, that's where these big files come in. So one of these, set it down on a table, go to town, do filing. Um, if it's just too much to file, come back with your uh, coping saw or your hacksaw and cut off more of the chunk until it's down to a reasonable shape and then file it the rest of the way to shape. So there was one question asking if you wax more frequently than just the first time. Uh, and then my question was, is that a smooth cut file or a, a rougher cut file? Um, it's a smoother cut file. Uh, you can use the, for really raw um, first shaping, go ahead and use a rough cut file. Um, the finer, the closer you are to your final shape, the finer the file. And then the, the wax, um, you can come back. If, if you think it's gotten dry, if the piece has gotten dry, absolutely come back and hit it with wax again. But you'll find that if you are wearing or using the piece very frequently, um, it's going to self-polish. Now that we have our design marked out, I'm gonna come in here with this and I'm going to start my, my lining. So, and I'm only gonna pick up just the bare, minimum of material that you can see that I'm working with here. And then I'm just going to rotate it a little bit. So bone has a grain and when I'm making a thing such as a cloak pin like this, the grain is running from this way down the length of it. Um, as a natural material, that grain is important. So if I was carving anything natural material with a grain, I want to be very careful when I'm actually working a line that is carving with the grain because it's easy for it to catch and carry that line all the way up the piece. And I don't necessarily want to do that. So again, why you only use the pressure of pushing your hand down on the tool instead of, and you can see I skipped a bit there. But when I skipped, what I did is I lifted the, the chisel so it skipped over the piece instead of uh, cutting through it. And that's just something you're going to learn over time. So now I've got that line basically just kind of sketched in there and I can move on to the next part of the piece and continue sketching that line. Now we remember that this one was supposed to go over. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut all the way across here. And believe it or not, it's actually a little bit easier to cut across grain with bone if it's a really tightly grained bone. Some bones are not very tightly grained. I wouldn't use them for this, but. This one is quite tightly grained, and so I'm going to continue. And you will just continue in this way across the entire piece until you get the whole thing lined. So you can kind of see how it catches the edges of that carving in the light. So once I've done that, and I've got it all lined out, and I've started to remove material, I'm gonna flip over to this side because this one's already underway. And you can see when I come in, I want to bring everything down to depth around the outside. I can always go back and make this deeper if I have enough material in here. I can come back and make it deeper. So 
But I, what I want to do is I want to take, uh, this is my round, which I really like for just coming in and removing a lot of material. Um, it's okay to remove it in lines. Think about this like sketching. So when you're doing relief carving, what you're doing is you're cutting away. And again, you can never put it back. So it's okay to cut a bunch of lines, go straight up and down. So I have a bunch of cuts that are vertical and they're kind of ugly, which is fine because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back from this direction and I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut this way. And what that does is that actually chips out a bunch of material fairly quickly to bring the ground of the piece down to the depth I want it. And yeah, you're gonna have to make a bunch of passes uh, to make that happen. But eventually you'll bring it down to the depth that you like. And then you can come in with um, your, your other tools and then shave it down and make it more smooth. Smoothing things out is usually a final task, um, especially with the ground, but you can also do it as you go. So as you can see, what I did is I just flipped over my round and I'm using this edge of the round now to actually help me in smoothing out some of what I just cut away. And again, there's no set way to do this. Basically, I'm using the tools that I have in the way that I've kind of learned works best. And the only way you're gonna learn what technique works best for you is by picking up a tool, picking up a piece of bone and practicing. And one of the cool things is that you don't actually have to spend all the time and effort cutting a piece free if you're just practicing. Uh, one of the most famous pieces of, of early uh, Bronze Age art in the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin is somebody has taken a chunk of bone like this and that the femur has all sorts of Celtic knotwork and all kinds of designs all carved into it all the way around. It's a practice piece and it's perfectly acceptable to have a chunk of bone like this and just sit down and go to, down, go to town practicing your techniques practicing what it feels like to do the carving. How would, how would you orient the piece? How would you do that work? And so now that I've come in and I've dropped my ground and I know where my outlines are, I'm gonna come in with my onglet here and then I'm gonna start shaping. So by shaping, I'm gonna cut in along the edge and bring the lower piece, I'm just gonna lower things just a little bit so that I can bring more relief into say this collar here. And this is where it's really important to kind of think three-dimensionally about how does, what needs to be on top? Well, the eyeball needs to be on top, so I need to raise it. So I would come in underneath the eye and just remove a little bit of material to sink the cheek below the bottom of the eyeball so that the eyeball stands out. But now that I've done that, I wanna make sure that that eyeball is rounded. So I'm gonna come back from the top here and just shave off enough of that edge to round out the eyeball so that it's more rounded and it actually stands out and looks like an eyeball. And you just do the same thing throughout the piece. So where we were following the curve here, you can see in that spiral, I still need to sink this side and this piece here is, is the back of the bird. So I know that it's gotta be lower than this beak here and lower than this spiral here and lower than this band here. So this piece, I can actually come in and just use the point edge. So again, I'm not using this point to cut. I'm using the flat edge, this flat rounded edge along the side of my onglet. Oops using the flat rounded edge along the side of my onglet to actually do the shaping with. So this has enough of an abrasive edge to it that I can use it for shaping bone. Bone is not so hard that this edge is going to get ignored. And so I'm gonna come in with that edge and do my shaping to drop it down below the beak and below the edge of that spiral. I'm just going to tuck it in. And this is a part of three-dimensional carving and relief carving that you're just going to learn through practice. 
but because we're working small, we have to think a little bit more and work a little bit more slowly. But you can kind of see now how I've brought relief to this piece, and it doesn't take a lot of cutting away to get the relief to show the difference between the edge of that spiral and the edge of this space and the space of the beak. And you're just going to go through the piece in the same manner through the whole thing. Um, and you also need to think about feathers. So one of the things I thought about was, well, this is the back of the bird. The edge of the feather, the long feathers, is always going to be on top toward the side facing the back of the bird. So I dropped that. How long did it take you to get good at, um, at like putting your visualization onto the bone? I have been a scribe and illuminator for uh, going on 40 years now. I know I don't look that old, but I am. Fountain of youth. Um, <laughs> uh, so for me, transferring is the design. The design itself was easy. The part that took me about 10 years now of work and practice was figuring out how to carve the relief and to get the depth that I want and how to make that shape happen. And that only comes from practice. Um, so learning to draw the shape or copy the shape or transfer a traced shape is fast. It's practicing the actual generating and making that three-dimensional shape that takes all the practice. And that's learning your tools and learning your materials. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mistress. Thank you very much, Mistress. Thank you, Mistress. Loved it.